Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this important discussion about uh, driving equitable compensation, recognition, and opportunity for attorneys of color. As Sophia mentioned, the issues of promotion, opportunity, credit, and compensation within law firms are increasingly of interest, both internally in law firms and externally with clients. Among those who have begun this necessary work in this area is MCCA. Before we delve into that work, Let's begin with a discussion about compensation and the role that origination credit still plays in compensation. Now, when I use the, the term origination credit, it can go by many names in different law firms. But what I'm what I'm referencing is the benefit or the credit that a, a partner or an associate or a senior lawyer receives for bringing a matter into a firm. So, Justin, let's let's start with you. Sure. Okay. Based on what you've seen, what are the, some of the levers that dr to drive compensation? Is origination credit still a significant factor? Uh, let's let's start there. Sure, thank you. So great question. So the origination credit still significant. Let me start there. It is still something that, by whatever name it's called, the credits by which a partner or attorneys in general or compensated a firm are still a big factor and probably always will be, at least into the near midterm future. The different levers that drive compensation or drive credits can be in different ways beyond just origination. So I think we'll start with origination, meaning the credits one might get or credits that are attributed to an attorney for bringing work in or hence originating that work and bringing a matter in a billable work to a particular firm, that's origination. A number of firms pay for various things beyond just the act of originating the work. Some firms will have compensation factors that run into management or responsibility for a particular matter, um, something that may be separate from the person who actually goes and finds the work. Um, some firms even will have certain credits that mirror how much a person works on a particular matter in terms of what's their actual credits or some reflection of the laboring or of their actual work on that matter uh, as well. But, but whatever the name could be, um, as you pointed out earlier, you typically see maybe two to three different ways that those are counted. And it usually has something to do with finding the work, managing the work, and then sometimes in the third case, some approximation of how much you're actually working on. That matter. You know, I would say in recent years, particularly over the past year or two, origination credits or credits that are linked to compensation are still a big metric. They've changed in a few ways, and really the change comes not so much in how the credits are defined, but sometimes in the metrics. I think with some of the events over the past couple of years is people have looked very hard, particularly in law firms, to try to be more equitable with compensation. You really have two ways you can go by. You can either kind of use the same formulas or ways that you might calculate credits up for someone, or in some cases, you may weight certain factors more than you normally would so that you kind of make a way for emerging partners or partners that you know have some sort of value, but you want to make sure that they're reflected and seen by the rest of the partnership as adding some value that perhaps in the past you didn't recognize. And just with that answer, you can imagine there's a lot of different ways to do that. Now, Justin or Samantha, let me ask you a related question. Have you also seen in the past couple of years, increasing transparency when it comes to how compensation decisions are made internal to a firm. Um, so I think I transitioned just in Samantha, so I'll take that as Samantha. <laughs> um, I, I think that, well, can I just say thanks? Um, it's really a pleasure to be on this panel um, at the MCCA Pathways Conference. And thank you to Jean and Sophia and the entire team uh, for putting together this fabulous conference for, for all of us. Um, so yes, I think that there is uh, an increased focus on the metrics. I think that, um, you know, that probably did start a couple of years ago. In fact, um, the hashtag Me Too movement um, contributed a lot, I think, to um, some in, uh, more visibility into 
the metrics and how compensation is done. And I think clients um, have, you know, for a long time been leaning into um, how uh, determining how partners are compensated and making sure that work is sent to attorneys of color. And we've had various things like, you know, calls to action, et cetera. But I think in the past few years, there's been more, um, uh, more clients demanding um, to sort of look um, more deeply into the metrics and asking for, for data, which has inured to the benefit of um, the DEI movement, I will, I will call it, for uh, diverse attorneys at, at law firms. Now, Tom, I know that you've spent a fair bit of time over the past 12 to 18 months on compensation recognition opportunity issues along with MCCA. Can you walk us through that work, which I know, you know, it's a long road, but there's been a significant amount of work that has been done in the past year. Yeah, thanks, Tina. It, it is a long road. Um, it's a journey that we're going to be on for a long time, but I'm, I'm so happy to see that, that in a lot of ways we've started that journey. Uh, let me start with some steps that we've taken at Microsoft and then speak to the work that's been done under the MCCA umbrella. Um, over the past six to 12 months, we at Microsoft have kicked off conversations with 10 of our biggest OC firms about compensation in the context of everything that they do to attract hire, develop, compensate, recognize, and promote diverse talent. We think it's important to see compensation as just one element of a comprehensive program to achieve DEI in the profession. Now, we, eat, we asked each of these 10 firms two things. First, how their program works from pipeline to partnership, because every firm does it differently um, in, when you get into the details. And secondly, what can we do to help? So we start with trying to get a better understanding of each firm's approach and in the process of doing that, underscoring how important getting this right is to us as clients. We aren't pushing a one size fits all approach. You know, it's gonna to have to make sense to the firm itself based on the way in which it operates, the way in which it's developed its practices over time. But we are clear that we wanna see progress. We also wanna know what we can do to help them achieve this progress because at the end of the day, if we're going to achieve these outcomes, it has to be a partnership between the clients and the OC firms that they employ. Now, turning to MCCA, MCCA has held a series of converse, conversations between law firms and in-house counsel on best practices to achieve equitable recognition and compensation for diverse attorneys. This, I think, grew out of a conversation that we had at, uh, at the conversation that, at the MCCA gathering a year ago. Um, but it was great over the course of this past year to see everyone come together and figure out what steps the law firms can take and what steps the in-house counsel uh, groups can take. These conversations led to the creation of a checklist for in-house counsel and a checklist for the law firms. Um, and these checklists are about identifying conversations that need to take place, actions that could be taken either uh, alone or in partnership with each other to achieve these objectives. Um, and I'm very happy to say, Sophia let me know that they, these checklists have been finalized and they will be published um, at the close of this session. So we hope that everyone begins to use these um, and that they get a lot of traction, a lot of water flows through these pipes, as it were, so that we can learn. Um, this is certainly not the perfect outcome, but it is a great start. And we're looking forward to talking about it a year from now after we, we see these in action and learn from them and develop them and develop them over time. Thanks, Tom. Samantha, to, to, to dovetail on what Tom has said and something you mentioned earlier about increased focus on compensation issues um, and transparency, transparency. In terms of directing the conversation at the right level, I mean, on the one hand, you want the conversation directed at the right level, but on the other hand, there's a concern internally within law firms amongst various diverse attorneys that they avoid political landmines and, and ruffle feathers that will actually blow back on them and make the situation worse. From the perspective of a client who's trying to help, what do you think is the best way forward or what are some ideas that, that clients could think about in terms of directing the feedback to the proper channel in a way that's productive and effective. 
Sure. So I think overall, um, avoiding landmines uh, for the person uh, or people you're trying to help is a, is a good goal and something that um, in, in the council should keep in mind because sometimes they can unwittingly um, put a, a, you know, a partner um, at a firm sort of, you know, in the line of fire because somebody internally doesn't like, like that the client is inquiring or trying to help that the diverse partner. So um, one way to avoid having any particular person sort of be put on the spot is to look at the systems as, as Tom was referring to and um, have it set up for, you know, this is what our expectations are of the firm and talk to um, the relationship partner, the chairperson of the firm, um, you know, heads of practice groups and uh, determine whether you all can agree on a system that would work for all of the matters with respect to how credit is, is given. Like for example, uh, many firms, um, if they're not already, they should be, um, I think, assigning credit by matter. So that could be a conversation that uh, the in-house counsel has with um, the chairperson or the relationship person in conjunction with the um, chairperson to say, we would like um, uh, credit to be given by matter rather than having one um, person get all the credit for the entire um, portfolio for that particular client. Um, so that's an example of something structurally that they can set up. Um, I will say, uh, it's helpful for in-house counsel if you want to make sure that somebody gets credit to actually email that person for the matter because um, the chances are if they are the intake person that will increase their opportunity to try to get credit to the extent that they're not systems already set up and uh, in place. And even if the credit, um, even if the matter is outside of that partner's practice area, you can still email it to them and then they can bring somebody else in or if you've developed a relationship because they referred you to somebody inside the firm, for example, Justin's a phenomenal IP lawyer. If Justin and I were at the same firm, now if we were Justin, I'd be fine with Justin getting all the credit. You can email Justin directly. But if you wanted me to share in the credit as a labor employment lawyer, you could email Justin and copy me and say, you know, Justin, I remember that Samantha referred um, our, us to you for IP before we have another matter. We would love for you to work on it. That way, um, Justin um, is in on the loop, but then Samantha knows that it's happening and Justin sees that um, it's partly due to Samantha's introduction relationship. And so that can help facilitate, you know, the credit sharing without um, doing anything, hopefully too overt that could cause um, internal rifts. But it's an indication as to who the client thinks should be getting the credit without having to have that direct, you know, why aren't you giving so-and-so credit type of conversation. I also um, think that, uh, you know, I don't want it to get lost about like the diverse associates as well, because, you know, we have to create a pipeline and be thinking about what are we doing with respect to our diverse associates, um, particularly as they become um, more senior and come closer to partner. And I thought about when Tom, you know, said, how can we help? And before, as I was preparing for the panel, I was thinking about how can they help? And I think that's actually part of the question to ask is have the in-house counsel talk to the relationship partner and say, I see um, so-and-so, Whitney, who's a phenomenal associate at my firm, for example, Whitney is gonna be up for partner soon. How can we help make sure that Whitney makes partner? Is it, um, you know, as an in-house counsel, can, can we mentor Whitney? Should we, um, have Whitney come and, you know, work with us on a secondment, you know, for three months so she can really get to know, you know, the client is sending an email to you talking about how phenomenal she is. Um, is that helpful to you? You can forward that to the chairperson of the firm or the practice group leader, or should we send an email directly to uh, the practice, you know, group leader? So those are the types of conversations that I think in-house counsel should be having with their relationship partners and figuring out like what is best to help the diverse associates and partners um, at, at the law firms. We've received a question from the audience and, and, and let me pose it to, to all three of you. But, but the question basically is if a non-originating attorney takes on a matter and, and what often happens as we see is it grows into other matters, but because of the structure of compensation in the firm, that non-originating attorney gets no credit for all of the work that he or she does. And instead it reverts to the relationship partner or, or whoever is 
deemed the, the, the person who gets credits for matters that are originated within that firm. How, how have you seen changes in this area? What's a, a good way to, to get a handle on making sure that the credit is going, or at least doing your best to make sure the credit is going to the right attorneys? Tom, maybe you could take that one as a, as a start. Sure. Um, I, I think a lot of the points that Samantha raised just now are fantastic. And I do think that those are the kind of conversations that need to take place between the relationship partner and, and the, the owner of the relationship of the, of the, the firm like Microsoft. Um, I think some of the things that, that Samantha talked about would definitely help. You know, if you give credit by matter and not by, you know, who originated the relationship itself, then at least you get to the step of each matter, you know, counting. And, and then if the in-house teams uh, get into the practice of making sure, again, what Samantha said is that you, you email the person that you want to get credit when you're opening up a new matter. And that's a very natural thing to do because you will have developed a relationship with the person who's doing the work and that you value so much. And it's not a big deal. It's not a hard step to take, but it is something that people need to get into the habit of doing. And, and I think part of this, you know, from an in-house perspective is about sort of cultural change, awareness, and arming people with sort of simple tools that they can use to really advance the ball here. You know, we've made some progress within Microsoft. I think many, many uh, firms have made progress in this sense, but, but it is a journey and, and we're not where we need to be. Um, once we get into the kind of detailed conversations that Samantha was referring to and get a better understanding of where our intervention can actually affect change and really make a difference, then we need to get that information for that firm in the hands of our relationship owner. And she or he needs to then to, to like take that and make sure that it's actioned and that people who are engaging with the firm on existing and new matters actually are aware that they, they can have this effect and that they should be taking these steps. Um, and ultimately, I think we'll get to a point where a lot of this is second nature and people will learn that it's just the way in which interaction takes place and you need to have this as part of your, your repertoire as a consumer of outside legal services. Um, Justin, uh, both sure. Samantha and, and Tom have mentioned this idea of, of the additional work that comes in. And for so long, the notion of origination has been divorced from the notion of what's called service. And increasingly, service is actually being seen as more maintenance of the relationship, which is extremely important because if the client's not happy, the work walks. How have you seen the interaction of clients along the notion of relationship affect the paradigm of compensation? Yeah, so I've seen that happen in a few different ways with the relationship partner. We'll start there as sort of the first point of contact. So a client who has had some history, or let's say you're and I've been in-house for a little bit, sometimes you even inherit a relationship. Maybe your predecessor had a relationship with a relationship partner for a long time at a particular firm. I think it's always important on the in-house side to engage in a conversation about who is that team? Who is the supporting cast around that relationship partner? Because the two go hand in hand, two meaning the relationship plus the service. The ability to service and go deep in that relationship and do well often relies on how well that outside counsel, or in particular, a group in that supporting cast for the relationship partner, know that company, the client, or the in-house counsel and what their challenges are. So I think in those communications, one guideline or a couple of guidelines I'd give is Try to get to know the supporting cast. Know who's coming up. Know who that team views as an emerging partner. And then make your views known. And make the views known that we've kind of talked about and hit on the edges of here on this, this discussion so far. That, you know, do you have any diverse members of your team coming up? Or, hey, I see this member of your team who's a fifth year. Is that the most senior diverse person on the team supporting our work in this area? I'd like to hear more about them. Um, would you like, would you give them a shot on my case? I'd like to make sure they practice in this area and give a chance to work with them. But try to engage in conversations in that way. What really happens there when you do that, particularly with most relationship partners at any type of firm, is now as the client, you're showing interest in someone else other than the relationship partner. It's going to behoove that relationship partner to make sure he or she then boosts up, buttresses, augments, and supports these other people that the client is showing interest to. 
And then the other point I'd make is it came up definitely in the conversation and some of the great answers Samantha had, Tom built on that. In those communications, even the simple written ones where you're talking to the relationship partner who has that history and history of service and longevity. When you make the email that says, hey, I'd like for you to put person B or person C on this particular um, work for us. And this is work we have not typically done with you, but we'd like to expand it. We've heard great things about this person. Whether you're saying something like that before the work is done or even more importantly, after the work is done, where you as a client say, hey, here's why I'm giving this work to this new person in this new area, make sure that's written. That'll have a lot of value to those, in, to those outside council partners as they try to raise that person up. And if they're in a firm that doesn't allow for credit beyond origination, that's often the beginning point of either changing that system or at least allowing that firm management the chance to come up with some way to make an exception to ensure they give that partner or person credit who was the non-originating non attorney, but who did a great job by bringing in or expanding the work. Thanks, Let me just make a brief announcement. In order to receive CLE credit for attending this session, please note that the poll is now live and you have two minutes to respond. Tom, what we've touched on something that's actually increasingly important beyond just compensation, which is the pipeline. How are we going to make sure that the next generation of diverse lawyers is positioned so that they are getting compensation, recognition, and credit? Um, one of the things I'd like you to explore with us is how your team ensures that matters are rightly staffed beyond just the pitch, but how do you make sure that not only the right team is on, on your matters, but they're also getting exposure and opportunities within those matters? Yeah, we, um, you know, we incent the assignment of diverse teams to our matters by providing opportunities for firms to earn a bonus through our law firm diversity program based on achieving diversity goals and how they staff engagements and the, their promotion of attorneys to partner. Um, we think that this practice conveys the importance of the issue to firm leadership, creates co-investment and partnership between us and the firm, and leads to positive change. It alone won't do the trick. I think we need to go deeper and think more broadly about how we can help the pipeline of, of diverse you know, attorneys at the firms. I think mentoring is a great, um, is, is a great point. Um, we, we have some relationships where we have men mentors and mentees um, in in-house and in outside counsel. And this is a very fruitful um, exercise. We think it's it's great for both parties. Um, and it's it's really good for the folks that are in the outside firm to get to know what it's like to be in-house, get to know the products, the the clients, for the company culture, how decisions are made more deeply. And that makes them more effective outside counsel without without question. Um, we have, on, in many cases, secondments from outside firms to fill gaps where people are out on parental leave or they, they've taken a sabbatical or on medical leave. And those have been very awesome opportunities for the sort of deeper understanding of the company, but also of the in-house counsel of the, the skills and capabilities of the firm attorney. Um, and so... Absolutely. Um, we're, we're also in the process of partnering with a number of our firms to mentor um, 1Ls, diverse students in law school, because we think that that's a, that's a great opportunity to, to spot talent, to give people a stage, to help them appreciate you know, what it means to be a successful attorney and how you navigate a career and make sure that they're on the radar screen of the, of the great firms that we work with day in and day out. And I, and I guess the one last thing, Tina, is, is organizations like MCCA um, and LCLD. I mean, we, are, we, are, we love participating. We love contributing and taking part and contributing and, you know, and, and hoping and helping um, these programs be successful because they go further than just tracking representation. They go, they build and sustain a more inclusive environment in which everyone can thrive. And that's good for the whole profession and especially for diverse attorneys within the profession. Thanks, Tom. Um, on that point of incentivization uh, on the pipeline, I know that 
firms are looking into that. And one of the things that some firms do is incentivize senior lawyers um, through compensation and ask what they have done in terms of DEI over the past year, um, whether it's staffing, whether it's opportunities for speaking, whether it's meaningful engagement um, with clients. Samantha, if you could walk us through what you have seen that's been effective in, in changing or helping turn, move the needle when it comes to the pipeline, um, that, that would be great to get your thoughts. All right. Um, I just want to say, I think, uh, Tom, it's fantastic. I loved hearing about the 1L mentoring. Um, I've served as a mentor um, for 1Ls at my uh, law school uh, many years, and it's great. I agree if uh, in-house lawyers um, and law firm partners um, or law firm associates, quite frankly, I've been doing it as an associate too, can get together and mentor you know, 1Ls and again, build the pipeline um, because that's what we really need to do. We really need to uh, build the pipeline from well before um, they become uh, associates. Um, but in terms of other practices, in terms of building pipelines, you know, to partners uh, from associates as well, yeah, I do think that um, in-house counsel should um, and law firms should look at the composition of teams and who is working on matters. Sometimes um, um, certain uh, folks are not as um, outgoing and like sort of go out there and like get work. And so sometimes um, it's helpful to have an assigning partner for associates, especially ones that are, you know, in their first, uh, you know, three years, if not longer of practice, so that we can make sure they're getting the, you know, the right skill sets and um, they're working with a number of different partners. And so they're uh, learning um, the practices and also um, having those partners have the opportunity to get to know those particular associates who they might not otherwise know and then they'll figure out how fantastic they are too. And so I do think having uh, an assigning partner you know, helps to make sure that we set them on the right path from the beginning um, and they're not in a situation where they're not getting enough, enough work and it becomes a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy or other partners say, oh, well, that person's hours are low. It must be because they're not as great. And then they end up not getting work. So definitely um, one should be looking at that. Um, clients um, should be um, talking to their, to their relationship partners about who is working on their matters. I have one particular client that sends out a quarterly report with um, what the target metrics are and um, where the firm is. And I love, and it actually has like green and red. And so I love that I'm always in the green <laughs> and um, I'm always going for hundred percent, even if the requirement's like 35, you know, for certain categories of women, people of color, et cetera. But, you know, as lawyers, many of us are competitive. And so when we see that, we're going to want to go for hundred, even if we're well beyond what the, um, the target metric is. And so I think that's um, really important to, to send those out. And so, so the firms can stay on top of that data. And um, it's really important, though, that if the firms are not meeting those numbers, to uh, reach out and have a conversation with them about, you know, as Tom said, how can we help? Um, and, you know, and then we can um, try to work together so that the firms are reaching those targets. And I think, quite frankly, having, um, you know, benchmarks and targets help um, lawyers, partners who are in-house who want to make sure that they're hiring a diverse team. because if the clients are you know, requiring diversity, I mean, ideally I understand that we should all strive for it regardless of what the clients are requiring, but some people need added incentive. And so um, if the clients are requiring diversity on their teams and they're you know, watching it and having discussions with the firm, then it can help those partners either go to their practice group leaders or go to the firm you know, chairperson and say, how can we help diversify you know, our entire bench this is something that you know clients are demanding. It's also the right thing to do. It also benefits um, the firm and the clients because we get better results with better, you know, with more diverse teams, as we know. Um, and so those are the types of conversations that I think clients and law firms should be having with each other, and that law firms um, should be having uh, internally um, with with the partners. Yeah, thanks, Samantha. I know I have I have seen some clients provide metrics. I've seen other clients actually um, look at the type of work that various associates on the matter are doing and, and then ask that the work be reallocated. And in one recent example, um, there was 
who happened to be a female associate, ended up doing a certain type of work um, that was more just sort of keeping the case moving along. And, and the way that this client handled it was, was to say, look, every month or so, if it isn't something that requires long-term knowledge, we're going to shift the tasks around. And, and the good thing was it, it spread the work around. It gave some of the associates who were more junior more opportunities, but it also sort of freed up and broke these notions of the kinds of work that women may be doing or diverse lawyers are doing. And it gave them not just a chance to do it, but it gave um, a real uh, a responsibility for folks who would keep saying, look, this is not, you know, I'm not really good at keeping track of this or I'm better at doing that. And it really kind of broke up the mix of the team. And, and some of the associates really started to shine and get second opportunities, which was, which was fantastic. Um, Justin, I don't know if you have anything to add along those lines. I, I do. I like your story there, Tina. I've seen also uh, in similar kind of thing with great effectiveness where a client in particular on a series of, of cases that turned into litigation turned around to the responsible, you know, the relationship partner and some of the more senior partners around and just said, hey, you know, I've seen these two associates working on the cases. They've been helping prepare people for depositions. They seem like they're on it. But why don't you not do the deposition? Let this person and this person over here defend these executives' depositions. I think they're prepared. Basically, on the spot, he just made the assignment decision for them because they are the client, basically. But also, I think, had the respect of the outside counsel, had been through you know the trenches with them in the litigation, was just at a point where uh, even this particular client representative had a good sense of sort of the knowledge of people on the team and kind of lightened it up, but also said, look, switch it around, put some of the more junior people on there and even use the term, hey, they need to practice, let, let them get started. And I think that kind of attitude, that's just one example. The more clients lean forward and do that, the better off we will all be. Many times because people are afraid, not just at the junior levels, but even the most senior people, they're afraid or they're victims of inertia at their big firm. You can shake that up a little bit at the client by doing that whether it's like walking around, getting to know the team live because they're defending you in depositions, or we've heard about it here earlier, just looking at the website and getting a, a good sense of who the folks are um, on the site. And then last but not least, one of the age old issues here, think about the people who were pitched to you initially when you got the marketing flyers and things, just make sure some of those young faces are getting a shot too. All of this helps position people so they can even ultimately be in the conversation to be getting origina origination credits. So, can I just jump in, Tina? Go ahead, yes, please. So um, so I agree with that. And I was actually thinking about that as we were preparing about, you know, what type of work, you know, associates could be doing. And especially as they become more senior, we're trying to position them for partner. And I also think that we need to be, um, or clients need to be mindful of, even as a diverse lawyer, um, even if we're partners, we too are concerned, you know, obviously about making sure we do a great job for the client and get them like great, you know, results. And so sometimes we, th we think, okay, we have to do it ourselves. We've got to do the depositions or we've got to, you know, argue the motions because we need to make sure that we get, you know, the very best results, you know, for clients. And we don't have, and, and I'm sure Justine, Tina, you guys have heard this. We don't have um, the luxury of being able to not do well. We have to make sure we knock out of the park and do a phenomenal job every time. So sort of giving us the um, space and the leeway and the opportunity to say, it's okay to have an associate take this deposition. It benefits the associate, but it also benefits the partner because they may not initially um, think that, not because they don't think highly of their associate, but they're trying to make sure that they're meeting the client's expectations. So I do think proactively, it's helpful for um, the client to have those kinds of conversations with the partner because the partner may not want to say to the client, is it okay if this associate takes this deposition because they don't want the client to make assumptions about what that means that may not be good assumptions. And so it's really great for clients to proactively reach out and um, give permission essentially to the partners to let associates take on more leadership roles within the within the matter. And I would also say, while I have the floor, um, building on Justin's point as well, that I think that it's important for firms to, firms themselves to look at who is uh, being pitched on matters 
And um, like a practice that my firm has that I appreciate is if you're being pitched on a matter or your, name, your, your bio is going in a brochure, you, the, the partner who's pitching with you, with your information has to email you and let you know, hi, I'm doing this pitch and I'm including your name uh, in the brochure as being part of the team so that there's that you know, transparency. And I think that firms should also you know, look at then when the matter, you know, when, the, when the client you know, comes in, if they land the client to uh, ensure that origination credit is being appropriately, whatever that means in that particular circumstance, I mean, that particular firm, but at least look at whether there, you know, there's an appropriate divvying up of the uh, credit for landing that client. Tom, I'm curious whether you have any additional thoughts uh, in this area. In particular, I, I have seen and, and heard actually clients who, and you mentioned incentivizing um, your, your law firms to staff. I've also heard of clients who penalize um, their, their, their outside counsel who fail to hit metrics and, and they'll take off a certain percentage of, of the outstanding bill and say, you didn't hit the metrics. Um, I'm curious what you've heard in this regard and, 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 and what you think in terms of what is or isn't appropriate. I know it all you know, depends on the circumstances, but we'd love to get your thoughts. Yeah, you know, Tina, as I've mentioned, you know, we've gone down the path at Microsoft of, of a more of a carrot approach where we incentivize outcomes and bonuses are paid through the law firm diversity program. And, um, and, and because we think that that works, but I will note that that is backed up by um, the permission of, of the company to whoever's generating the work to walk away to, to take their book of work or take their matter and go to another law firm if they don't think that enough progress is being made in the diversity space. And so um, it, is a, it is a combination of, you know, yes, let's, let's use these financial incentives to move behavior, to, to incent behavior. But at the end of the day, you know, it has to work and it has to work to the, to the, to the level that, that we expect it to work or, or that the individual who's generating the work wants it to work. Um, it's, it's absolutely true that there are other ways to approach this, and other firms, other companies have taken a different approach. That they they have, as you mentioned, they've created more of a penalty system, um, and I and I think that those can take many different forms. And and honestly, that's okay. There's no silver bullet here. There's no one path to progress. What we need is for everyone to be in the game and trying to trying different things to 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 make the progress that we want to see. We'll learn from it. And as long as people are transparent about what's working and what's not working, and we have a broader discussion about this in the community, you know, hopefully everyone will learn from everybody's experience and people will continue to make evolved choices going forward. Thanks, Tom. Just picking up your phrase in the game, um, one of the issues that um, lawyers of all stripes, senior and, and junior face is whether or not they even have an opportunity to get in the door to do some of this work. Um, I know that some of the clients that, that we have have uh, undertaken efforts to say, look, we have work in this space. You don't do that work for us. I'd like to meet your diverse lawyers. Justin, I'm curious whether you hear increasingly clients engage and try to solicit information about other diverse lawyers who don't do their work, but could potentially do their work in the future and whether you think that's effective as a, as a tool, both internally and externally. I do, and quite uh, pointedly so. I think when clients specifically come to a firm and say, look, we're trying to do better, or we're trying to work with you to do better, or we're concerned about the whole profession, who else do you have in your team, even not in my area? I've certainly had that from some companies where they've gone as far to say, look, certainly would love to know diversity you know, candidates or diverse attorneys in my area, but I'd love to just know who else you have because our whole company has this as a, as a big, you know, as a goal we're going for. And that's something I've seen definitely in the past 18 months to two years. So right up front, it has an impact in a few ways. First, as soon as that conversation is had, particularly if you're asking for someone outside of someone's practice group, at most big firms, what that's going to then spur on is just discussion amongst that firm's management. Typically, when things stay within a practice group, it's going to stay with that relationship partner, stay within sort of that little family that's always been doing the work you know, on task A for this particular client. As soon as it's something that they don't normally deal with, it seems like a big deal. That's where actually lawyers and firm management can truly do their job. 
And once they have something like that, you'll see a lot of interest in the firm around that inquiry. Generally, if it's a healthy firm, you'll see people work very hard to try to pull together, okay, hey, here's our list of people. And invariably in that process, at most firms, the answer will be like, oh my goodness, we don't have enough, or we have so few, or we've got maybe one diverse attorney in this group, none in this other group. Let's do what we can to respond to the question now in the short term, but it certainly is a great starting point to get people thinking about what's gonna happen long-term and how do we build a pipeline and how do we do a better job in retention and all the other different types of things that relate to the factors we know are important so that someone can be, to use Tom's phrase, in the game long enough to make partner or close enough to make partner where origination credits will matter uh, for that person. Well, I, can I just jump in, Tina? Absolutely, please do. So um, I agree with everything Justin said, um, obviously. I would say that um, clients should feel free or potential clients should feel free, not necessarily to just rely on what the person that they're emailing at the firm tells them. And actually go onto a firm's website and look at people yourselves and look at like their bios and suggest people. I actually got a call um, you know, relatively recently from somebody because they knew one of my partners um, in a different office, but then that person um, went on the firm website and looked through bios and found my bio. And then, you know, said to that partner, can you please introduce me to Samantha Grant? So, you know, that's helpful too. You don't have to necessarily as an you know, in-house lawyer, wait to see who you're emailed by the relationship partner. And um, especially if you're just saying, if you're asking them to put together a team, rather than waiting to see what the team looks like that they put together, which may or may not be super diverse, you know, ask them about certain people like, oh, have you worked with uh, Tina? I looked at her bio, she's phenomenal. Do you think she would be, you know, good for this particular case? So um, it, it can be more, um, it doesn't have to be as passive in terms of waiting for information. You can go and, and find it, uh, find it yourself. And I would say to while I have the floor, if I may, about Tom with the being in the in the game, I um, I think that's great to have. You know, whether it's a carrot or a stick approach, I think there are benefits uh, to, to both. But I would say, you know, for clients, if you are thinking about um, a stick approach, like you know, removing work or something like that, that you look at it by you know potentially by practice group. Or by, you know, rather than, you know, we're taking all of our work, you know, from a particular firm, because it could be just one particular partner that apparently has not, you know, gotten on the train uh, of DEI, and it wouldn't be fair to those other ones, especially if some of the other folks are diverse partners, that they would lose the opportunity because things are not going well in a different part of the firm. And so I think in that type of circumstance, it's important that the client go to firm leadership. That's when you call like the chairperson. That's why you have chair people and executive committees and governing boards of firms. And that's when you bring them in and say, you know, look, um, Justin's doing a great job uh, of getting us diverse, you know, teams and ex excellent results in the IP area. But in another area over here, you know, our, our contracts, uh, you know, or whatever the other area is, we seem to, you know, not have um, a good diverse bench how can you help? And then maybe, you know, get the, you know, Justin, get the, you know, corporate partner and get the chairperson in a room together to have that kind of conversation. Because sometimes, you know, um, you know, a client will be upset by one particular practice area and then they would, they'll leave the firm. It's really like unfair to, to, unfair to the others who may not even know what's going on, let alone have a say in what's going on. Those are great points, Samantha. Um, we have a question from the audience, and I'm going to read it out. It seems that insurance company claims teams control distribution of work in some matters. This seems to hamper diversity efforts in some ways. What is the best way to see work where the claim will be covered by insurance? Um, it'd be great um, if any of you has thoughts on that. I know from from at least at, at our firm, we do a fair bit of insurance work and, 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 and there are diverse lawyers in the group. I, I know that at least for some of the clients, 
um, they will look at the kind of work and see if part of it can be peeled off and someone who is diverse can handle that part. And it's not traditionally in the rubric of insurance. If they don't think, and I don't mean insurance per se, but if there's a group or a practice area that is not as diverse, they look at the totality of the work and see if there's a portion of it that maybe some other group could handle and bring in diversity that way. I don't know if that would be effective in all circumstances, but that's certainly something I have seen happen. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that's that's a good approach, an approach that I think a number of firms try, something we certainly have done um, if there are, and this question sort of brings up two thoughts in my mind. So if it is a situation where outside there's talent outside of the group that orig originally got that work, obviously that's why you have teams, that's why you can use the strengths and weaknesses, even goes to what Samantha was saying, one practice group may be far ahead when it comes to diverse attorneys, another may not be and still be kind of on that curve. And so take advantage of those diverse practice groups to the extent you've got the relevant experience on them. I think the other piece that brings up, and this may be a little bit more controversial, is I think it's sometimes it's not just a one-way street in the, you know, in the conversations. Much of what we talked about today have been almost one way from sort of what can in-house counsel say to uh, law firms or the prospective or current client say to a law firm who's servicing the work. But law firms can have those conversations as well and say, look, we've got this kind of work in. Here's the problem I'm facing. I've got this kind of team here. I do have talent in other places. What do you think? Here's where I'm trying to go. Can I put people on there to get more practice? That's a question in the kind of conversation that I've seen also work in the other direction and do go pretty well, at least with companies that are willing to partner over time to get teams up to a certain level of diversity. Thanks. Well, I, go ahead, please. Go I can agree more, Justin, that, you know, and that, and that's sort of what I was alluding to before, that, you know, law firms know what the right thing is to do, not just from a moral standpoint, but from a bottom line standpoint, from client's perspective, et cetera. So some of this work is stuff that we as law firms should be doing on our own. Now, sometimes we need the incentive from uh, Tom and, and, and other uh, individuals like him, but there's some stuff that law firms already should know and should be doing regardless of whether they're getting you know, calls you know, from clients. And that you know, includes, for example, um, tracking the types of work that associates are doing. That's what I meant, you know, before about, you know, having the assign-in partners, making sure you're, you know, building the right skill sets from the inception with associates. You know, you know, you you can and maybe should be tracking whether diverse associates or you know, if they leave the firm, whether the attrition looks different for diverse associates than it does for non-diverse associates. You can see whether there's you know a problem there. You there are all sorts of things that you know firms should be doing and can be doing to make sure that they have an inclusive environment and are building a pipeline. And quite frankly, shouldn't have to wait for clients to come in and ask questions before they do them. I think these are all fantastic ideas and practices. And it does show that the, I think the idea that MCCA has come up with of checklists for in-house and for, uh, for law firms is a great idea. And as we go forward and we throw things in there and it becomes part of the general practice of these two communities working in concert, but also separately uh, is a great thing. And I think we're, we're gonna learn. I think what, what's really important, I think about all of this is that we normalize the conversation about this, that it is not a one-off. It's not an odd thing. It is just how we do business, how we think about the provision of legal services, the consumption of legal services, the development of talent in the, in the profession. And I, and I think that's, that's one of the, if we can get to that point where it's not unusual, it's just part of the natural motion of things, it would be fantastic. If we don't have a lot of time left, so I want to get each of you to give us one final thought. I mean, these are important conversations. It's an important subject. And some of these conversations candidly are hard to have, um, but that shouldn't um, stop any of us from having the conversation. And as Tom said, if we can get to the point where the conversation's not hard, but part of normal everyday life, then, then it will be better for all of us. But Samantha, if you could leave us with one thought, that would be fantastic. Um, I would say communication is key <laughs> internally and um, with your clients and, um, you know, just think about um, as many opportunities as you can for um, how to partner with and get to know uh, diverse lawyers, even if um, as a client, you're not um, in a position yet to send uh, 
a piece of billable work to someone, but if you want to really grow your relationships, think about you know, doing pro bono work with, with a law firm associate and or partner, getting to know them that way, getting to know their litigation style, mentorship as, as we've talked about, but really you know, it's about communication and building relationships and, um, and, and the collaboration and the partnerships internally at law firms, but also between law firms and in-house counsel. Thanks, Samantha. Justin. Yeah, no, I was going to say the same thing, literally communication. I think the only additional spin I can put on there, it kind of relates to what we talked about earlier, but communication with the spirit towards collaborating or achieving a goal in diversity. And a, a quick example of that would be when you as an in-house person ask a relationship partner about people on their team who are up for partner, that's like one of those honest communications where you're going to need both sides to collaborate to get to the right point. You'll have to ask questions like, well, how much business does a person need? How many, many hours do they need? And then think to yourself, okay, how much of our work can I give to this team that goes to that person so he or she can make partner? That means there's going to have to be a lot of communication on both sides to get to that point. Thanks, Justin. And Tom? Not surprisingly, I completely agree with Justin and Samantha. The, the only two things I'd say is start the conversation and then continue the conversation. Just make it part of the natural rhythm of the interaction between the in-house team and the OC firm. Um, I, I think just by beginning the conversation and making it the part of normal practice, we will see, we'll see a lot of improvement. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha, Justin, and Tom for, for this wonderful panel. Thank you all for joining us. Um, our time is up now uh, and you'll be heading over to your next session. Thank you. Thanks, Tina. Thanks, Tina.